Hello Facebook. We are live here at Crosby Community Church and I'm excited. We are uh, starting a new program tonight. Uh, we are going to read the Bible in the next 40 weeks. And uh, man, that's a big commitment, isn't it? Yeah. Huge commitment. It's a yeah. huge commitment and it's uh, going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And I'm excited because we're going to go from 7 to 9 o'clock every Tuesday night. Well, that that's, sounds long and it sounds like it'd be hard for you to make it for 40 weeks, but we are going to record this and it will be on our Facebook page. So if you miss a Tuesday, it's not going to be a big deal. You'll be able to come back and uh, check it out. Or you can just read it on your own. You don't have to, you don't have to read it with our guests if you, if you don't. And Rob is going to uh, log a schedule, so he's going to let us know uh, what, we're, what we're reading. And uh, we are not doing a Bible study. This is not what this is. It's a Bible reading. And we're going to ask you not to ask questions on Tuesday night uh, at, if you're in person here. But you can uh, ask them uh, via Facebook. You can uh, put your messages on Facebook. And if you have questions, we'll come back and scroll through them. And uh, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I've got lots of friends. So uh, if I don't have the answer, we will find out the answer for you. So it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. It's new, and I'm going to have Rob come in right now because we want to all be on the same book. Um, he's, uh, this is Rob Power. Come on in, Rob. We are going to be using the NIV, which is the New International Version. And if you don't have that Bible, Rob's going to tell you right now how to get on to the NIV Bible. Sure. So just go into your, your app store of whatever um, phone you have. Um, iPhone, Google Phone, whatever, and type in U version, V E R S I O N, and you'll get a um, U version Bible that will pop up, and that's the app you want. It's a brown, looks like a brown Bible with um, Holy Bible in it, and if you um, download that, you will get a, uh, a version um, that will. Um, pop up and look like this and then you just have to go into um, and just, there's a read on the bottom and it goes right into the verses and you can follow us through there and we'll be telling you where we are we're starting in Genesis so we can start with Genesis 1 and in the beginning is where it starts so very easy you can do the, the version is NIV so that we're all on the same version um, and it's all free. So it's a great app. There's other plans on it that you can do um, for yourself later, but you can just read along with us on this one. Fantastic. Jack? Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest tonight. Uh, each week we're going to have two readers. And um, I've got quite a, quite a cast lined up for you. Uh, so it, it should be a little different uh, having different people read and um, tonight we have Mrs. Bev Haas, and we have Mr. Frank Henniger. <laughs> and uh, this kind of reminds me of Friday mornings. It seems almost like we should be doing Friday morning, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's yeah. many Friday yeah. mornings. <laughs> yeah. well, the three of us have hung around for six, seven years now on Friday mornings at the Harrison Junior School, where Mrs. Haas is a retired junior school teacher. Great for you. Uh, last year was Mrs. Haas last year. Uh, big alligator tears there because we love Mrs. Haas and yes. we'll miss her. Uh, but I got a feeling she may just show up some Friday mornings. I, I couldn't, you know, promise that, but I'm thinking that she might not be able to help herself and yeah. she may uh, show up. So uh, when, when uh, our folks read, they're going to read 20 minutes at a time. Uh, they will probably take a small break in between reading as, as the, the other guest sets up. And so you'll be able to do this. Uh, we've got two guests walking down now. Uh, I see uh, Logan and Mariah, his girlfriend, they're coming. Sweet. So that's, that's amazing. You know, you remember Logan, don't you? <laughs> and you may have had these two. I don't know. I think Mariah may have grew up in Colerain. So we've got them coming down. So as I said, uh, we're going to be reading out of the NIV. You can post your questions uh, right to the page. 
and uh, Mrs. Haas, you are going to be reading Genesis 1, and I'm going to put a timer on you, and when you get close, I will, I will let you know that uh, your time's coming up. Um, you know, don't, uh, we're not trying to speed race. Okay. Just, uh, oh, are you going to ask us any questions? Oh, yes, I did want to ask you. Uh, you're you. right. Good. I did want to ask some questions of these two guests. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to know if you two have any uh, favorite verses. We've sure. always got favorite oh, verses. Yeah. Don't we? <laughs> we got favorite verses. All right, Mrs. Haas, tell me what's your favorite verse. Um, my favorite verse actually goes back to when I was a kid growing up in church. I was part of a Bible Bowl team. Uh, where we studied and memorized scripture and was extremely nervous at one point and our youth minister's wife gave us this verse and I have clung to that in times of frustration and it's from Isaiah 40 39 and it's King James because that's how I learned it in the old days but it's they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they will rise up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I cling to that because it gives me hope. Yes. Whether I was teaching and I got tired, whether it's now dealing with COVID stuff, mm -hmm. but it's wait. wait. God will lift me up and I will have the wings of the like like So that is the scripture that I cling to. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. How about you, Mr. Ah, uh, the scripture I cling to. Uh, well, there's a couple of them. Uh, Matthew, no, you can only pick oh, one. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, but my favorite is 1 Peter 3.15. And that one is, but set apart in, in, in your, but in your heart set apart uh, Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. Uh, so, uh, but do this with gentleness and respect, uh, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And the reason this is my favorite verse is because when I first became a Christian, man, I would pound it down your throat. I would just thump this Bible at you and I didn't do it with gentleness and respect and I, I didn't know this. I wasn't a very gentle person. I was evil, wicked, mean, and nasty. <laughs> but, uh, but when I read this verse, oh, it began to speak to me. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I can do this with gentleness and respect. And so I worked at it, and, and now to this day, see, notice how gentle and respectful I am now. <laughs> that's, awesome. that's my favorite that's, verse. That's great. That's great. And the, the next question, I, and I'll start with you, Frank. Who had the most influence on you? Uh, coming to Christ. Oh, the most influence on me coming to Christ was a man named Paul Hine, who is no, he's in heaven. He's waiting on me in heaven. And uh, this man was an elder at uh, Miami Town Church. And he invited me. He was my life insurance man. And so he, he invited me to church. And, uh, 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 well, mm, okay, uh, because I'd never went to church. I didn't know nothing about church. Uh, and so he invited me, and then me and my wife went. And uh, uh, we did go back right away, but he hung with me, and him being my life insurance man, we were uh, friends together. And, uh, and so finally he invited me again. They were having a revival, and we went down, and man, I, I got on fire for Christ. And I gave my life to him, uh, to Jesus, and uh, never looked back. And that guy uh, spoke into my life for many years. And uh, until we went home to be with uh, Christ. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah. How about you, Miss Sauce? Awesome. I don't know any other way than being at church. Mm. I mean, my, you just, we always went to church. I've always had a faith. I just, I don't know any other way. So I would say my parents, my grandparents. Oh, yeah. And then as a kid growing up at church, I had phenomenal youth leaders, wow. mm. Christian friends, youth pastors the wives of those youth pastors, all of those people fed into my life. Mm -hmm. I can't pick just one person because it was like they were always there and we were always at church. Mm -hmm. It was just 
part of the progression of life. Um, as I got older, they just kept feeding me. Now, I would say it's probably Phil that holds me accountable mm -hmm. and my son that holds me accountable. There are some teachers at school that have held me accountable. But as for first becoming a Christian, it was like... Lots of seeds. Yeah, lots and lots of seeds. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You talk about one, one other thing, and she talked about people holding people accountable. I have a, a little hand in my Bible, and I wrote five people mm. that kind of hold me accountable. Right. And they are uh, Miss Willissa, if you know her, uh, my wife, Rhonda, she's a hottie. <laughs> and Mrs. Haas, John Calabrese, and Jack Phillips. <laughs> On this little hand. And add to I'm, I'm on the pinky finger. I'm sure. <laughs> the pinky we did those at Friday morning Bible study one day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. But I wrote that and I keep that in my Bible and that to remind me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they, they hold me accountable. Well, we better get going on this or we'll end up being in 45 weeks or something oh. crazy. So, so, with that said, uh, Mrs. Haas is going to read first. We are going to be in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, so please follow along. And with that, take it away, Mrs. Haas. All right, I'm starting in Genesis 1, and this is the very beginning of God's Word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse, and he separated the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Then God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great sea creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be faithful and increase in number and fill the water in the sea. Let the birds increase on the earth, and let there be evening. And there was morning, and the fifth day. Then God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that move on the ground, wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. 
and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and to all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give you every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the sixth day. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. There was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pison. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land's good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of the Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs on the east side of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. So the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from every tree in the garden, any of them, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God took a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, we can eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you're going to die. <laughs> you're not going to surely die, the serpent said to the woman, 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and the woman heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, um, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, that woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you're going to eat dust all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush her head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Well, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For dust you are and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And then the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Cain and Abel, chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and on his offering, he didn't look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. When the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? And why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you have to master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go on out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? Well, I don't know. Am I that brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. 
So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. Irad was the father of Ahael. Ahael was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Zillah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father who all who, all who play the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, Tubal-Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal-Cain's sister was Nama. Now Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Chapter 5. From Adam to Noah. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, created a male and female, and he blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived 912 years and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. After he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Although Enosh lived 905 years, or altogether Enosh lived 905 years, and then he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahaliel. After he became the father of Mahaliel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. When Mahaliel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. After he became the father of Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahaliel lived 895 years, and then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more, because God just took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah, and he said, He will comfort us in our labor and painful toll of our hands caused by the ground the Lord is cursed. After Noah, had, after Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right. I'm glad I don't have to live 969 years, Frank. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you don't think let you're you, going to make it? Okay, Frank. Okay. We're going to let you take the driver's seat, Mr. Frank. <laughs> if you need to take a break, just take a few minutes. And... Uh, Give you about a minute or two before we get you started. All right. Thank you, Bill.
there is a test, there's going to be a test. So you guys. Okay. Yeah, over all those pronunciations. Yeah, over all those yeah. pronunciation yeah. stuff. So be ready. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, right, Mr. Frank, let's go to chapter 6, what do you say? Are you ready? Yes, sir. Uh, chapter 6, the flood. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw. The daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be numbered. 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Oh, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, hey, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both of them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower and middle and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath uh, of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you uh, to be kept alive. You will take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Chapter 7. The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird and female to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came to the, on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood and pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the floodwaters came to, on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, 
On that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heaven were opened, and the rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of their three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings and pairs of all creatures that had the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. And the animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God commanded Noah. And then the Lord shut him in. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and the waters increased. They lifted the ark high above the earth, and the water rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. <laughs> and they rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet, and every living thing that moved on the earth perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth and all mankind and everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. Chapter 8. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven had been closed. And the rain had stopped falling from the sky. And the water receded steadily from the earth and the at the end of 150 days, the water had gone down, and the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window. He had made the ark and sent out a raven, and it came flying back and forth until the water dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. And he reached out his hand and he took the dove and he brought it back to himself in the ark. And he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in his beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. And then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. And he waited seven more days, and he sent the dove out again. But this time, it that did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's six hundred and first year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. And then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and the creatures that move along the ground so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. So Noah, he came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons, wives and all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds and everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark one kind after another. And then Noah built an ark, an altar to the Lord and taking some of, of all the clean animals and the clean birds he sacrificed burnt offerings to, on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, 
Even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood, never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Chapter 9. Oh, God's covenant with Noah. A covenant is an agreement. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and the dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the seas, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you, just as I have given you green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat me that had this lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of this fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in numbers. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds and the livestock and all the wild animals and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it <laughs> and remember the everlasting covenant or agreement between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. <clears throat> so God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. The sons of Noah, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark was Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. And these were the three sons of Noah. And from them came the people who were scattered over all the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. And when he drank some of his wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham the father of Canaan saw his father's nakedness. Oh, and he told the two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and they laid it across his shoulders. And then they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father's nakedness. Well, when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Oh, cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves. Will be, will he be to his brothers? And he also said, "Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth, Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave." After the flood, Noah lived three hundred and fifty years. Altogether, Noah lived nine hundred and fifty years. And then he died. Chapter 10. A table of nations. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The Japhonites. 
the sons of Japheth. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Jabin, Tubal, Meshes, and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer, Askenaz, Riphath, and Togarmah, the sons of Jabin, <laughs> Elisha, Tarshish, and Kittim, and Rodanum. From these, the maritime people spread out uh, into their territories by the clans with in their nations, each with his own language. The Hamites, the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabbatha, Ramah, and Sabbatica, the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and that is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Erech, Akkad, Calanet, and Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Gala and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Cala. That is the great city. Mizraim was the father of the Ludites, the Anamites, the Leavites, the Naturalites, the Pathrocytes, the Casualites, from whom the Philistines came, and the Capthorites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Giragashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Aradvites, the Amorites, and the Hamathorites, and wow! Later, the Canaan clan scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon toward Gehar, as far as Gaza, and then toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Ad Adama, and Zeborim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of, Hed, of Ham, by the clans and the languages in their territories and nations. The Semites. The Semites. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. Son, the Semites. Uh, sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was... Oh, wait a minute, I just read that. The sons of Shem. I've I lost my plate there. <laughs> the sons of Shem. Uh, uh, Elam, Asher, Araxved, Lud, and Aram. And the sons of Aram. Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshish. Uh, Araphix Araf uh, was the father of Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber, and two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg, because in his time the earth was divided. His brother was named Jachtan. Jachtan was the father of Amadad, Shepla, Hazarmatheth, Zerah, Hadaram, Uzzah, Dikla, Uba, Abinamoth, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab, all these were sons of Jachan. The region where they lived stretched from Mesha towards Sephar in the eastern hill country. And these are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. These are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within the nations. Uh, from their, these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. <laughs> Your time's up. Oh, 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 man! man. Uh, I got through some of those names, anyhow. You did well. You got those names and not well. me. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> those names are wild. <laughs> Doug, you better practice up. Doug will be reading next week along with Scarlett Hudson. So those will be our two readers next week, and you guys are setting the table pretty high. I just
want you to know when I read through the Bible, I skip all those names. <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah. I know it's God's inspired word, but who cares about all those names? <laughs> and you did a great job, Mr. Frank. I, you can hardly stumble on one. Do you want us to read all those names? I would. I would. We, are, we, are going to, we are going to read the entire Bible. Uh, as we can do silent reading on that part. <laughs> <laughs> you always have that. great ideas, but I would like us to read them? them all. Yeah, that's great. And then Jack. that way we'll look so human because oh, none yeah, of us we are perfect. Look human. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm going to be up here reading too some nights. So, all right. Uh, yeah, we, we, Just we'll wait. Up. I feel sorry if we ever get Leviticus and Numbers. Oh. Uh, all right. We, we've tower. already had people reject going that night. Oh, so. Yeah, I can imagine. All right. Tower of Babel, chapter 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Pretty awesome. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come on, let's bake bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, Come, let's build a city for ourselves with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that they, we could make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they won't understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. From Shem to Abram, this is the account of Shem. All right, get ready for these names. Thank you. <laughs> Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Araxid. And after he became the father of Araxid, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxed had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Arphaxed lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after he became the father of Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Ruth. And after he became the father of Ruth, Peleg lived 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ruth had lived 32 years, he became the father of Sarag. And after he became the father of Sarag, Ruth lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarag had lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And after he became the father of Nahor, Sarag lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 20 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Hera. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Hera, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Chapter 12, The Call of Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I'm going to show you. I will make unto you a great nation, and I'm going to bless you. I will make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 
He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and he set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And so when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, that's his wife. Then they're going to kill me, but they're going to let you live. So say that you are my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared plus of you. So when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his place. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram required, uh, acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, maid servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and household because of Abraham's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why didn't you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. <laughs> then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Chapter 13, Abram and Lot separate. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Now Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. And from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land couldn't support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they weren't able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living on the land at that time. So Abram said to, to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine. For we're brothers. It's not, it's not the whole land here before us. Let's part company. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of Jordan was well watered, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, though. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of the Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents toward Sodom. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked, and they were sinning greatly against the Lord. So the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Lift your eyes up from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see, I'm going to give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anybody can count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go and walk through the length and breadth of the land because I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he built an altar to the Lord. Chapter 14, Abram rescues Lot. At this time, Amphrael, king of Shinar, Antioch, king of Eleazar, somebody, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Gollum, went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gonera, Sinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zobim, and king of Bela, that is Zoar. All the latter kings joined forces in the Valley of Siddam, the Salt Sea. For 12 years, they had been subject to Kindalomar, but in the 13th year, they rebelled. 
In the 14th year, Kindalomar and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaelites in Esteroth, Canaan, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shevra, Carthan, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir as far as El Param near the desert. Then they turned back and went to El Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole ter territory of the Amalekites as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon, Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adam, the king of Zobam, the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddam against Petalomar, king of Elam, Tidal king of Gom, Aphrael king of Shinar, and the Ariot king of Elsar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddam was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew, Lot, and his possession since he was living in Sodom. One who escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobath, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods, brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other men, or the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Ketalomar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies unto your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods to yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. To Aner, Eskel, and Mamre, let them have their share. Chapter 15, God's Covenant with Abram. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. And he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him. He cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he didn't cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. 
In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When in the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a flaming fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Hagar and Ishmael, chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord's kept me from having any children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah took his wife, Sarah his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows she's pregnant and she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant's in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that's beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants, they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You're now with child, and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, she said. I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Berlia Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. All right, Frank. Frank. You didn't fall asleep, did you? No. No, 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 no. no. Well, I was <laughs> Thank you, girl. You did a great job. Yeah. You're on 17. 17. One second. <clears throat> no drinking, please. 17. The covenant of circumcision was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight 
days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant is your flesh, in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any circumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name is, will be Sarah. And I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be mother of all na of nations. King of peoples will come from her. And Abraham fell face down. And he laughed. And he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? <laughs> and Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. And then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. And I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. And I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household who, or bought with his money and every male in his household and he circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that day and every male in Abraham's household including those born in his household or bought from a foreigner was circumcised with him. Chapter 18, the three visitors. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent, to his tent, in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he heard from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, Oh, if I have found favor in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a let her water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, so you can be refreshed, and then, then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said. Get three sayas of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran to the herd and he selected a choice tender calf and he gave it to his servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and a calf that had been prepared and he set those before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in year, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So <laughs> Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, Oh, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? And then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid. So she lied and said, oh, I, I did not laugh. But he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Abraham pleads 
for Sodom. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. And then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. And then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great that the sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. And the men turned away and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And then Abraham approached him and said, Will, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it for me to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked and treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then Abraham spoke up again. Now, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous less than 50, is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? Oh, if I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? Oh, and he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? And he said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, uh, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham returned home. Chapter 19. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them. And he bowed down with his face to the ground. My Lord, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night. And then go on your way early in the morning. No. Nope. They answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And he, he prepared a meal for them, baking bread with that yeast, and they ate. And before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. And they called out the lot, hey, where are the men who came to you tonight? bringing them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old with blindness, so they couldn't find the door. The two men said to Lot, 
Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or uh, anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here. Get them out of here. Get them out of here. Because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against the people is so great that he had sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters and he said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But <laughs> his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, urged Lot saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here and or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and then led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. And as soon as they brought them out, one of them said, flee for your life. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my Lord, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I will die. Look, here's a town near enough to run to and it's small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, very well. I will grant this request to you. I will not overthrow the town you speak of but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, and the sun had risen over the land, the, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the land out of the heavens. Thus, he overthrew those cities, and the entire plant, including all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked fat, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, and he returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw a dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Lot and his daughters. Lot and his two daughters left Zohar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zohar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. And one day the older daughter said to the younger, Oh, our father is old. And there's no man around here to lie with us. As it is a custom all over the earth, let's get our father to drink, to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine, and the oldest daughter went in and lay with him. And he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night, I lay with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight. And you go in and lie with him so we can preserve our family line through our fathers. So they got up. So they got the father to drink wine that night also. And the younger daughter went in and lay with him. And again, he was not aware of it when she lay down and when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. And the older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. And he is the father of Moabites of today. The youngest daughter also had a son, and she named him ben Amini. And he is the father of the Ammonites of today. All right. You got one more in you, Mrs. Haas? Sure. All right. I love your voices for the women. I <laughs> quit it. You sure they do a nice job. <laughs> I thought it was just his voice. <laughs> it is, but he, you know, he throws it. Right. Abraham and Abimelech, chapter 20. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed in Gerar, and there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, She's my sister. 
think he'd learn. He's done this once before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You're as good as dead, because the woman you've taken, she's a married woman. Mm -hmm. Now Abimelech hadn't gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And didn't she say, He is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in a dream, Yeah, I know you did with its clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That's why I didn't let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you can be sure that you and all of yours are going to die. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all of his officials. And when he told them what had happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You've done things to me that shouldn't be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? Abraham replied, well, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place, and they're going to kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he's my brother. Then Abimelech brought sheep and cattle, male and female slaves, and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, My land is before you. Live wherever you like. To Sarah, he said, I'm giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offense against you before all who were with you. You are completely vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and a slave girl, so that they could have children again. For the Lord closed up every wound in Abimelech's household because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, Sarah. Chapter 21, the birth of Isaac. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time that God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah born. When the son Isaac was eight years old, Adam circumcised. Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God's brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this were going to laugh at me. And then she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Well, the, master distress, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Don't be so distressed about that boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on, the show, set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered into the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. When she went off, then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, for she thought, I can't watch the boy die. And then she sat nearby and began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called out to Hagar from heaven and said, What's the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. When he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his, boy, his forces, said to Abraham, 
God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not go falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me in the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness I've shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who's done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech asked Abraham, What's the meaning of these seven ewe lambs you've set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba, because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Chapter 22, Abraham tested. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll tell you about. So early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We'll worship, and then we're going to come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he carried the fire in the night. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. Well, the wood and fire are here, but where's the land for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they settled for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Nahor's son. Sometimes late, sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Uz the father, firstborn, Buzz his brother, Kemuel the father of Abram, Hasid, Haso, Pildash, Jipsa, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore the eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Ruma, also had sons, Teba, Gaham, Tehesh, and Micah. 23, chapter 23, the death of Sarah. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kareth Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abram went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose from beside her, his dead wife, and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You're a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. 
Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites, and he said to them, If you're willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf, so that he will sell me the, the tomb of Machpelah, which belongs to him and is at the end of the field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people, and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of his city, No, my lord, listen to me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing, Listen to me, if you will, I'll pay the price of the field. Accept it from me so I can bury my dead there. But Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my Lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. But what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver according to the weight current among the merchants. So Ephron's film in Mechpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field were deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is in Hebron in the land of the cave. So the field and the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. Chapter 24, Isaac and Rebekah. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, one in charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I'm living, but will go to my country for my own relatives and get a wife from my son Isaac. The servant asked him, well, what if the woman's unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country from which you came? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send an angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of its master, Abraham and he swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of goods from his master. He set out for Aram Nahum and made his way to the town of Nahor. Hit the camels kneeled down near the well outside the town, and it was toward evening, the time women go out to draw water. And he prayed, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please, down your jar, or please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water one of your camels too. Well, let her be the one that you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I'll know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, and she was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled up her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels, too, until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to determine whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring, weighing a becca, and two gold bracelets, weighing about ten shekels, and he asked, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milka bore in Nahal, and she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. The man, bent, the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. 
As for me, the Lord has led me on this journey to the house of my master's relatives. The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he'd seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and he heard Rebecca tell what the man had said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the canvas near the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord. Why are you standing out here? I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house, and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought in for the camels, and water for him and his men to wash their feet. The food was set before him, but he said, I won't eat until I've told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. So he said, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he's become wealthy. He's given us sheep and cattle, silver and gold, men servants and maid servants, camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he's given him everything he owns. My master made me swear an oath. You must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go back to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. So I asked my master, what if the woman won't come back with me? He replied, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you can get a wife for my son from my own clan and from my father's family. Then when you go to my clan, you will be released from my oath, even if they refuse to give her to you. You'll be released from my oath. When I came to the spring today, I said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I've come. See, I'm standing beside this spring. If a maiden comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar, and she says to me, drink, and I'll draw water for your camels too. Let her be the one the master, the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water, and I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels. And I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Micah bore to him. Then I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arm, and I bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you'll just show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebekah. Take her and go. And let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, Send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, Let the girl remain with us ten days or so, then you can go. But he said, Don't detain me. Now the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on in my way so I can go to my master. They said, Let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and said, Will you go with this man? I'll go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, O oh, sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of the enemies. So then Rebecca and her maids got ready and mounted the camels and back, went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. Now Isaac had come from Bar Hollow Road and was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who's that man in the field coming to meet us? He's my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her in the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Chapter 25, The Death of Abraham. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Medim, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. The descendants of Dedan were the Asherites, the Letishites, and the Lamanites. The sons of Midian were Ephah, 
Ephor, Hanak, Abida, and Elda. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac, but while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Together, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age. An old man and full of years, he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the, in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. Then Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. And after Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived in Ber Leheroi. This is the account of Abraham's son Ishmael, who Sarah's maidservant Haggai the Egyptian bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael listed in the order of their birth. Neboahath, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kadar, Adil, Mishpah, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hada, Tima, and Jeter, Napish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the twelve tribal rulers according to their settlements and camps. Altogether, Ishmael lived 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur near the border of Egypt as you go toward Asher, and they lived in hostility toward all their brothers. This is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Isaac became the father, Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian, from Pada Aram, and sister of Laban, the Ar Iranian. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. The two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to him. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quit, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was called it Edom. And Jacob replied, Well, first sell me your birthright. Oh, come on, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is that birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. All right, Mr. Frank, can you finish it out through 30? Ooh, let's see. We just happened to have you under the light. Is it enough light? <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> it's getting hard to see. That's awesome. Yeah, we are going to be doing three weeks of the Old Testament and one week of the New Testament. So we'll finish out Genesis next week and then we'll go on to Exodus and uh, from then we'll go to Matthew. So just so you know, we're going to finish out that way. The, the Old Testament is 75% and the New Testament is 25%. So that's why we get three weeks of the Old and one week of the New. Except uh, for this week and next week. No, this is the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Next week will be the Old Testament. The next week will be the Old Testament. And then we'll go to Matthew. Oh, okay. So that's how that will work. Uh, every week will be a little different. We may end up 10 minutes early. We may end up 10 minutes late. Just depends on, on what we're doing. We're, we're reading through 30. So it's on you to be the anchor man. Through 30, right? Through 30. Gotcha. All right. Ishmael and Abimelech, chapter 26. Now there was a famine in the land beside the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. 
For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands and my decrees and my laws so Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, Oh, she is my sister, because he was afraid to say, Oh, she is my wife. And he thought, Oh, the men in this place might kill me on account of Rebecca, because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca. So Abimelech, summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? And Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. And then Abimelech said, uh, what is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who molest this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds in service that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham and the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. And then Abimelech said to Isaac, Move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there, and he camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, Hey, the water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. And he moved on from there. And he dug another well. And no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in this land. From there, he went up to Beersheba. And that night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. And Isaac built the altar there, and he called on the name of the Lord, and there he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzah, his personal advisor, and Philcol, the commander of his forces. And Isaac asked him, uh, Why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? And they answered, We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So he said, There ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but always treated you well and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and they drank, and early the next morning the men swore an oath to each other. And then Isaac sent them on their way, and they left in peace. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. They said, we found water, and he called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. And when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and also Basmoth, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Chapter 27, Jacob gets Isaac's blessing. 
When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, uh, My son. Oh, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare for me a kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. And when Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it to back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare, prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he liked it. And then, and then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Oh, Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Oh, but my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? Oh, I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. And his mother said to him, Oh, my son, let that curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Get Go and get them for me. So he went and he got them and he brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. And then Rebecca took the best clothes uh, of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house and put them on the younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and a smooth part of his neck with goat skins. And then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. And she he went to his father and said, My father? Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to the father, uh, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. And Isaac asked his son, uh, How did you find it so quickly, my son? Uh, oh, the Lord your God gave me success, he replied. And then Isaac said to Jason, uh, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son, Esau, or not. And Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice in the, is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize them, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. Oh, I am, he replied. And then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. And Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought some wine, and he drank, and then his father Isaac said to him, uh, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him, and he kissed him. And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, like the Lord is blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. And may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from honey, and he too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. And then he said to him, uh, My father, sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. And his father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled violently and said, Oh, who is it? Who was it? Then 
that had a game and brought it to me. Oh, I ate it just before you came. And I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. And he said to his father, oh, bless me too, father. No. But he said, your brother came to save me and took your blessing. And Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my brother and now he's taking my blessing. <laughs> and then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? And Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you, and have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, uh, Do you only do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And then Esau wept aloud. <laughs> and his father answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you grow rest restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. And Jacob flees to Laban. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, oh, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. And when Rebekah was told that her oldest son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Oh, your brother Esau is consoled, consoling himself the thought of killing you. And I then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban. In Haran, stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Oh, why should I lose both you, both of you in one day? And then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from the Hittite women like those, my life will not be worth living. So Isaac called for Jacob, and he blessed him, and commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Badan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there, from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother, and may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of people. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. And then Isaac sent Jacob on his way and he went to Badan Aram to Laban, son of Bethul, the Armenian, uh, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Benan Aram to take a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Benan Aram. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. So he went to Ishmael and he married Mahatha, the sister of Neboeth, the daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set and taken one of the stones there. He put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac and I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. 
and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Oh, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, Oh, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and he set it up on, uh, as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, Oh, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking, and he will give me the food to eat and the clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be my God's house, and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Chapter 29. Jacob arrives in Padan Aram. Then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. There he saw a well in the field with three flocks of sheep laying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. And the stone was, uh, the stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Well, Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? Oh, we're from Haran, they replied. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, Nahor's uh, grandson? <laughs> yes, we know him, they answered. And then Jacob asked them, Is he well? Oh, yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter Rachel uh, with a sheep. Look, he said, the sun is still light. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. Oh, we can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. And while he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And when Jacob saw Rachel's daughter, Rachel, daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. And then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and the son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father. And as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he heard to meet him, he embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home, and there Jacob told him all these things. And then Laban said to him, You are my own flesh and blood. And after Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the young was Rachel. Now Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel, oh, was lovely and warm and beautiful. And Jacob was in love with Rachel, and he said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, uh, it's better I give, that I give her to you than some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. And Laban gave his servant girl Zipha to his daughter as her maidservant. Well, when morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, Hey, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, uh, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one, also in return for another seven years of work. Wow, 
and Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Now Laban gave his servant girl Bila, Bilha to his daughter Rachel as her maidservant. And Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. Jacob's children. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. And she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Oh, because the Lord heard that I'm not my lo- I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, uh, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. And then she stopped having children. <laughs> We're going to stop right there, friend. Okay. Okay. That was fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Rob and I are praying that uh, our scripture reading changes us, and we pray that it changes you as well. Um, you're on a marathon. <laughs> it's the first week of 40 weeks. It's going to be awesome. And uh, thank you for tuning in tonight, and I hope you'll be back next Tuesday. God bless you.